Thank you, Louis. Um, since the light is a little bit blinding, um, I'm going to keep my hat on. Um, Leif put me as final session for comedic relief. I know I'm competing against beer, but I'd still like to introduce Traffic Server. So thank you all for uh, staying here. And welcome to my little introduction of my pet project. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm Igor Galich. I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and I work on HTTPD and Traffic Server, though Traffic Server's been occupying most of my time lately, so I don't work on, traffic, uh, on HTTPD anymore, so that much. You can find me uh, on the internet most of the time. Uh, you can tweet me. This is a picture of me from last time. Maybe I can update my next presentation with a prettier picture. But I suppose I would have to update it with a different face. Yes, I know Leif. <laughs> Here's a little bit of an overview of what we're uh, going to be looking at. Um, we'll take a look at who uses Traffic Server, and there are um, a few users of Traffic Server um, representing the company or not, but maybe they can tell you what they're using it for, and I hope they will. Um, I just realized that's a little bit out of order. <laughs> Like I said, I'm, I'm here for, for comedic relief. I know I'm competing against beer. Um, so what's a proxy cache and why you should use Traffic Server? And we'll also look at uh, the history of Traffic Server, uh, which is how it got uh, open source and how it got into Apache and what you can do for your project, if it's a commercial project, uh, to get it open. And I'm going to leave, uh, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes maybe for questions, but you can interrupt me anytime with, with questions. And um, I'm probably doing a bad job here, but uh, I'd like people to get involved in Traffic Server. We need, uh, we need to see much, much more involvement, especially in a couple of areas where we're lacking like documentation and uh, presentation. Another thing that we'll see um, tomorrow may, uh, is Ellen will be talking about Traffic Server as well. So if I didn't manage to scare you all off completely, uh, you should take a look at uh, another interesting use case of. Uh, um, of this software that I haven't, uh, I haven't quite seen yet because, yeah, it's uh, it's big and complex and can use uh, use it for many things. Um, so here's uh, from our website a list of prominent traffic server users. Um, Yahoo, of course, who donated the software. Brian, can you wave to the people? Yes, he's, he's from Yahoo. Um, Comcast and uh, Tobao, which is a company in China who are pushing insane, insane amounts of traffic um, over, over traffic server. LinkedIn, I don't see Brian. Did you? Did you leave him somewhere or? Oh. And OmniTI, uh, we've seen um, Theo Schlossnagel this morning uh, talk and talk a bit about traffic server as well. So all of these uh, companies are um, using different aspects of, uh, of traffic server and Yeah, 
simply because we, we have so many different use cases, uh, maybe you should take a look at what you can do with a proxy and with a cache, and what uh, traffic server in particular can do for you. So what, uh, what is a proxy, what is a cache? Um, what a proxy basically does for you is it helps you shorten this distance between a user and your website. And uh, this can be across the globe. This can be in, within your company LAN. It doesn't really matter. It helps you simply shorten this, this distance. And it can do this in a number of ways. Uh, it can do this as a forward proxy by making those requests for you into the internet. Um, it can do this same thing um, as an intercepting proxy, as a transparent proxy, and this is what Ellen will be talking tomorrow. So you don't have to even take care of the configuration. In your company LAN, you simply configure all connections that go out into the internet to go through a transparent proxy, and it, uh, and this proxy will then take care of making the connections. Or uh, you can use it as a reverse proxy and put it in front of your application servers so that they don't have to take every single hit because this uh, proxy server can then cache uh, those requests uh, in a sensible manner. Sometimes uh, it's enough to cache it for just uh, 10 seconds as we've heard, or one second as we've heard Theo talk, because it's, it's simply not necessary to have uh, this, uh, this level of freshness. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, you can cache things forever. Images are a good, uh, good example. Static assets, you can cache those simply forever and when it's time to update an image, you simply rename it. You give the version just like you uh, would give with any other um, package or any other thing that you release. You give it a new version, you deploy it, and uh, that way you can once again uh, store it forever. And uh, yeah, this, these are the things that a uh, a proxy cache can do for you. It simply, um, it, it can eliminate a big number of requests for one, and for the other, it can uh, shorten the distance to your users. And this is, uh, the, th this idea is what, um, th this idea is what gives us CDNs. So if I have my users, or a big, uh, big chunk of my users, sitting in India, for instance, it will be a horrible user experience if they have to go across the globe to reach my website. So it really helps a lot if I position a, uh, a server in India. But I don't want to take care of this server. I, uh, um, I don't want to deploy anything on that server. So the easiest solution is to put a proxy server there, a caching proxy server, and um, configure the DNS such that in India it points to uh, my cache, and this cache then goes back to, I don't know, to Germany, fetches the site, and delivers it to the user. So for the first uh, access, of course, this will still be slow, but every consecutive access will, uh, will be much shorter and give uh, people a much better experience. Okay, um, I'd like to use this for, uh, uh, I'd like to use this here uh, as a little bit of a break, and um, I'd like to call up a few of those people who are sitting here and representing different companies or different parts of our development communities and just uh, show, uh, give you a short idea of what they are using uh, Traffic Server for. 
So, uh, Luis, if you could either hand the micro through the round or... That's me. Well, start with Leif or with Alan. <laughs> uh, I don't use it personally. I have, uh, do consulting and have several clients who use it. Uh, one uses it for local ISP work so that they can minimize the bandwidth they have going upstream while still serving rapidly to their local clients by caching things that are commonly used across the, the local site, which would be similar to a corporate net. Uh, another client who uses it to do basically middleware, uh, they use it to uh, download original content in different formats and then uh, by caching it, reserve that reformatted content to various clients uh, very rapidly without burdening the original servers nearly as much, saving them uh, their upstream costs and making their customers get better results. Uh, I'm Brian Call. I'm from Yahoo. I was one of the original developers that um, helped open source uh, Apache Traffic Server. Um, currently, we still we have two versions of Traffic Server at Yahoo. We have our original Yahoo Traffic Server, and then we have the Apache Traffic Server. I maintain the packages for Apache Traffic Server and make uh, special tweaks and stuff to the code that we need. Um, we have it completely for our, our CDN. Our CDN is completely uh, running off of Apache Traffic Server. Um, runs a lot faster than our original version did. <laughs> um, less bugs, it doesn't crash as often. Um, easier to maintain and things like that. Um, and then also we get the benefit of getting all the patches and stuff from the open source development community. Um, that's about it. Uh, there's other groups that are actually starting to use Apache Traffic Server. All of our calendar and stuff um, runs on Apache Traffic Server and a few other internal groups that um, continually ping me and ask me questions and uh, help me diagnose their problems, or I help them diagnose uh, problems. That's about it. Um, my name is Jan van Dorn. I, um, I work at Comcast. We, um, we distribute video with uh, Apache Traffic Server and, and, and have really great plans of, of distributing a lot of video using Apache Traffic Server. Uh, most of the video right now is, is multicast video up until the edge. We're moving that to make it point-to-point um, um, -point video, um, HTTP request basically, and, and Traffic Server is an incredible tool to do that for us. Um, so yeah, we did an evaluation in the beginning of 2012 of all the caching um, software, proxy software, caching software that was out there, and, and Traffic Server just performs, outperforms anything that's out there right now for the use case that we have, um, which is very, very large library video um, and an incredibly long tail in the, in the terms of, of how we speak of it, which means we have an, a lot of content and, and we, we need to distribute that to our customers. It, it seems to um, outperform anything that's out there right now. Uh, yeah, so if you go to our, um, right now, if you use our Xbox application or if you use your iPad or iPhone or your um, PC to go to our XfinityTV.com website, all of that traffic goes through Apache Traffic Server. We have hundreds of servers right now. We plan on having thousands of servers running this stuff. The cable box, not, but we are deploying, we're starting to deploy in January, in July of this year, we will start deploying cable boxes that will be using IP to get their video on the map. The broadcast live TV, we also want to do on Apache Traffic Server, but that's a little bit longer down the road, and we will have, you know, things like ABC, CBS, NBC, those channels will always be multicast all the way to the client. Thank you. Uh, just a quick reminder, if, you, uh, if somebody's got a question and they don't have a micro, please repeat it, because we're recording the sessions. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian, and this is Manjesh. We're from LinkedIn, so we're actually heavily invested in Traffic Server also. So we use Traffic Server um, everywhere from the edge down to, we actually use it internally for caching as well. So uh, we use Apache Traffic Server as actually our security tier. So this is, at, at the edge, we actually use it for optimization and security. So we've actually also integrated Google's PageSpeed library to do PageSpeed transformations on content as it's going out from the client. Apache Traffic Server has been, been great for that. Um, we've used it, as I've mentioned, for security, so we'll do all kinds of uh,
blocking based on a number of rules in, and uh, are you, authentication? Uh, I'll mention this later when I come to extensibility, but are you using IronB? I've, we've looked at IronB. We're not using IronB. Okay. Um, we've, we've basically developed our own security infrastructure on top of it. But, uh, but that's just a testament to, to Apache Traffic Server's uh, great plug-in environment. It's absolutely unbelievable in what you can do. Um, also, we've, we use it internally for, for development tools. So when engineers are, are building a new feature, developing a new web app, we've used Apache Traffic Server for, to allow them to share their, their web apps. And so all our development happens through a single Apache Traffic Server box. Um, it's, well, it's, it's redundant, but one box can support all the, the development load. That's going to happen at, uh, at Velocity. So the question was, when is LinkedIn going to open source um, our version of, of PageSpeed, which is a transformation on top of Apache Traffic Server? And that's going to happen at, uh, at Velocity this year in Santa Clara. Or hopefully sooner, but no later than Velocity. Um, so yeah, what else do we use it for? Did leave anything up? Oh, we use it for UI content aggregation. So um, because uh, Apache Traffic Server's model allows you to fetch content in parallel, we're actually able to assemble documents in real time from a number of different web services. So we do it for UI content aggregation, and we use it basically everywhere. So every single request goes through Apache <laughs> Traffic Server several times, so, and that's it. OK. Thank you. Uh, Zhao, do you want to say anything? Luis. <laughs> Uh, I'm from China, Taobao.com. Uh, I think I'm the biggest user in the community. Uh, we have about 2,000 boxes running traffic server. At peak, it uh, uh, pushed uh, about uh, terabits, terabits per second. Uh, it's, uh, it's very stable in, in our usage, usage and uh, very efficient. Uh, we are doing the uh, reverse proxy in production for the biggest uh, size, busiest site in China. Uh, if you have any questions on the stability and the and cluster or, or the hardware configurations, please you may find me on the community. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, as you see, the, the use cases are pretty diverse. I myself um, have used it as a replace for um, Apache HCPD as, as a front end. Uh, I know Jim is going to have a talk about mod proxy and how awesome is it, it is, but yeah, I, I switched to traffic server for uh, <laughs> um, uh, simply because the cache is uh, is so so much more stable than that of um, uh, of HCPD, uh, and the reason for this is uh, because I can uh, simply bypass the biggest hurdle in mod caches. Uh, in the case of mod cache, which is the file system. In traffic server, we, um, we just don't use the file system. You give the cache uh, an entire disk, or better, a couple of disks, and it writes raw to those disks. That's what we recommend for production use anyway. I mean, you can uh, put it on a, uh, on a file system. It will then write into a single file, but uh, this is what uh, what gives it the edge. This is what gives it that speed. But I think, um, I mean, Jan has uh, has done this this test uh, testing with different uh, proxies and caches, and actually, I mean, most of them are pretty fast. I mean, they're they're really, really, really fast. And for most of us normal people, we don't really need 300,000 300, um, requests per second on a single box. But yeah, we, we can deliver that. 
So that's, I mean, fast isn't really a selling argument if you're uh, in, uh, in proxy cache business because everyone is fast. I mean, everyone except for squid probably, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's another kid. Um, the other thing that uh, I, I really like about traffic server is that it's extremely scalable and that's one thing that we also don't really have in HTTPD. In traffic server, when you start uh, when you start up traffic server, it simply looks at your hardware. Uh, it looks what you have. It looks what you give it, how many disks, how many CPUs, how much RAM. And uh, it, sell, uh, it, it does a self-configuration with our developers here, best guesses, uh, as to what will give you the, uh, the best performance with the, uh, on that hardware. So, uh, it's, it's scalable already on that hardware that you give it, but as uh, Zhao said, they're using it uh, in, in cluster configurations, so you, can have it mul on, um, so you can have it run on multiple nodes, and you can have it in a hierarchical configuration, so it also, of course, scales uh, uh, horizontally. And then, of course, the other selling argument, as we have heard many, many times, is that it's extremely extensible. Um, we've, uh, we've had a tutorial on Sunday. Uh, a lucky or unlucky few have had uh, the chance to, to attend it. And yes, our API is a little bit complex, but once you've wrapped your head around it, um, it's, it's also extremely powerful. I mean, I don't want to compare it to Node.js, but yeah, we have an event-based model, so um, it's also multi-threaded, so it's very complex to uh, wrap your head around it at, uh, at first, but once you get it, you can uh, create extremely uh, powerful plugins, and this is, uh, I believe, another major selling point for Traffic Server. Um, uh, one of my favorite developments lately has been from James Peach, who I don't see right now. He has uh, written a plugin um, for Lua, so that you can write your own plugins in Lua. And I believe that this is uh, a great step forward, uh, because as admins, and I'm just an admin, uh, you don't really want to uh, go down into C or C++. Uh, if if all it takes is 12 lines of Lua code for me to get something done, that's pretty cool. And it, if it works, and I hope it will work out soon, uh, at least we're here this week um, hacking, um, then uh, that's another great uh, feature. So, okay, time for history lesson. Um, as Brian mentioned, it, um, Traffic Server has, uh, has been donated to the Apache Software Foundation uh, by Yahoo, but this isn't where it originated. It originated in a company called Inktomi. Yahoo simply bought uh, Inktomi because of their search product and they uh, forgot about all that awesome software that Inktomi had. Uh, then, um, I don't remember when it was, but Yahoo decided that they needed a CDN, and back then Leif found that there was a useful piece of software that uh, could maybe be uh, simply put on a, uh, on a piece of hardware and uh, uh, put to good use. This was, uh, this was traffic server. It needed a little bit of cleanup. Um, because it had been sitting around for a couple of years and nobody had touched it, so uh, it, uh, it needed a little, bit, um, a little bit of a cleanup to get it running. But once it was running, it was already delivering uh, an enormous performance uh, and doing the right thing. It was doing uh, what they needed. And Leif decided that this is uh, really great and they wanted to share this uh, and open source it. And um, Leif and Brian and help me out, who, who else uh, headed the effort? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, so um, the effort came from, uh, from engineering, but uh, they had a lot of support from management, and uh, this is really, really important. You need support from management, uh, because one of the uh, most painful parts about open sourcing a big, big project, and by that time, Traffic Server had uh, over 700,000 lines of code. One of the uh, really most painful parts is going through all, the, uh, through all of that code and making sure that the IP is cleared, so uh, that you know which line of code belongs to whom and if they are okay with you open sourcing that. Um, with a lot of um, that code, they simply went uh, a conservative approach and deleted it, which is also uh, one of my favorite activities in the traffic server project. It also helps a little bit with performance. You simply rip out 30,000 lines of code and suddenly uh, everything is a little bit faster. But with uh, many parts were really useful and they had to be checked and lawyers had to go through it. Another thing, of course, is at that time, they had the product running in production and they didn't want to put the source code into open and uh, had everyone look at it and find all of those ugly security bugs and then exploit the service. So they went through rigorous uh, security audits and made sure that those, uh, that those leaks are fixed, actually. So that, uh, that gave us... Uh, a bit of a more stable code, a code base to work on. Um, when it was donated to the Apache Software Foundation and uh, came into the incubator in 2009, if I remember correctly, it, it was reduced from 700,000 lines of code. It was down to um, 400,000. Um, they had ripped out everything that wasn't HTTP because it had uh, capability for FTP and 90s uh, streaming protocols that nobody uses because everybody only uh, uses HTTP these days anymore. So it was uh, down a substantial part. I think SNMP got ripped out, LDAP, authentication, many, many things got ripped out and it got really slimmed down to uh, by 300,000 lines of code. Um, by the way, after uh, donating it to the incubator, we did continue reducing code size a little bit. So we, I think we're down to 240, 300, something like that. Three, 300,000. 350? Did, oh. We're slacking. <laughs> Why well, are we adding code? We are adding features. That's good. Um, so in um, the nice thing about this uh, long and painful process that involved uh, many managers uh, fighting against lawyers, I imagine, in, um, or with them, um, and, and getting the, the code base cleared and uh, the code base I, IP cleared was that it only took 10 months um, to go through the whole incubator process because a, a big chunk of, uh, of the incubator process is making sure that the IP is clear. I don't know, uh, I, I think the commu uh, community track where we talk about the incubator is in parallel to this one. Uh, you, would, you would learn a big deal about how the incubator works and how open source works uh, in that track. But since we're in parallel, since we're competing, I think this is a Good little add-on. Okay, so uh, we rushed through the incubator. The project really rushed through the incubator uh, in comparison. And in 2010, it was a top-level project. And um, in 2011, I think, Yahoo uh, dropped out. It pulled 10 developers out. But the project survived because at this stage, the community was already quite healthy. And we're continuing to get in new developers uh, from all over the world and many from, uh, from China and from Tobao. 
Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's not enough. I think we need more uh, people. I think we need more, more involvement. So, whoops, awesome. So how do you get involved? Um, first of all, you can use it. You should use it. You definitely uh, will find a good use case for it. And yeah, then you will probably stumble across some uh, issues in the documentation or maybe even find a bug. Uh, one case or the other, I, uh, I invite everyone to try it out and to come to us, uh, to our IRC channel, to our mailing lists, and to uh, give us some feedback. So, any questions? Where's my beer, maybe? I don't know. Uh, I know that Alan does, but other than you, does anybody use uh, ATS in a transparent uh, inline topology? <laughs> I'm really keen on, on learning how it works tomorrow, so maybe I will. <laughs> so, so I can maybe answer that. So Akamai, I don't know exactly where they are in the state of that product, but they, they, their plan was always to use uh, traffic server in, in a transparent intercepting proxy case. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously don't work on Akamai, so I can't talk for them, but th that was their, their purpose of using traffic server. I also take stupid questions. If, if you think your question is stupid, I, I've done teaching. This one. Um, hi, I'm Josh Mint. I work on um, the PageSpeed optimization library, so I'm highly interested in the work that LinkedIn has done. But uh, I wanted to ask you kind of a pointed question. If you could contrast um, why you would pick Apache traffic su server over Nginx if your goal is uh, to process a lot of requests. I have started a horrible uh, document, it's called Y Traffic Server, it's, it's, uh, it's got a hor horrible formatting. Let's see if I can find it, uh, probably not. Uh, so the thing is, uh, many uh, proxies and caches have different kinds of feature sets. Uh, one of the feature sets that Nginx is definitely lacking is a proper um, ex uh, extensibility. I mean, you can extend uh, Nginx, but if you do, you have to recompile the whole thing. Um, another uh, issue with Nginx is that it's a pretty poor cache. <laughs> so um, depending on what you need, if you need to extend uh, the product, if you need it to cache properly, um, if, I don't know, if, if you need it to scale to horrendous amounts of, um, of requests per second, um, I think all do that quite that well, but it, um, yeah, if you, want, uh, if you want to extend it, then Nginx is probably the wrong one. Yes. So I have one more problem with Nginx, and that's the fact that it doesn't talk HTTP. Really? Is it that bad? It's that bad. OK. <laughs> so um, th that's actually uh, a good point. Thank you. I I'm, I'm sorry if, if I'm interrupting you, but uh, just to get this one across. That is actually uh, one of the many issues that people have in adopting traffic server is that it expects your back end to speak HTTP. And by that I mean to get the headers right. So if you want your uh, back end's content to be properly cached, it should deliver proper cache headers. If you want it to be invalidated, it should send those headers as well. Or I don't know, maybe write a plugin that, uh, for WordPress or something like that where you 
hey, I updated my site here, purge the cache. But the problem with this expectation is that many, many, many backends, many applications simply don't speak HTTP. So. I'm kind of interested in the details of what is not HTTP about Nginx. I don't actually don't know that much about it. Uh, we've started to use Nginx, uh, to dabble in Nginx. We have like a preliminary port of my PHP to Nginx. Could, but as could you, you speak know, up? Uh, sorry. Um, but the main difference that I saw, and I was hoping you would elaborate on this point, is that Nginx is kind of a multi-process. Um, it's, it's a little bit like Apache pre-fork in that it is multi-process, but it's a little bit not like it in that it's highly asynchronous. Um, whereas my understanding of Apache Traffic Server is that it does a lot more with multiple threads that um, Nginx doesn't try to do. So Apache Traffic Server probably has more complicated contention issues than Nginx does, and I was wondering how that impacted performance at really high queries per second. <laughs> We found Please. that um, NGNX uses the file system to, uh, to write, and we found that it just doesn't perform nearly as well with a lot, of, a lot of disk drives and a, and a lot of, um, you know, on larger systems, high volume traffic. We find uh, Apache Traffic Server is, in our workload, much, much, much more better performance. Like what, what's the typical number of queries per second you can get? So we, queries per second, we are large objects because we're video, it's fragmented video, our average size is one, one megabit, yeah, one megabits per second. So we push caches up to yeah. 20 gigabits per second, easy. Could, um, could you pick up the f yeah, microphone, sorry. it's probably so, easier. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's directional, it's really. Weird. So we, we push caches up to 20 gigabits per second, easy. We have 24 spindles and we read and write at, at really, really high, um, um, bandwidth to the drives, and I think that's where our NGNX was really lacking to us because it writes to the file system and it has this extra layer that you have to go through. And we found a big performance difference in our use case between NGNX and uh, a traffic server that way. We've, we've done some really primitive testing, but uh, it already shows uh, if in traffic server, if we use the file system, and, and again, I want to point this out, uh, we don't use it in the same way as ModCache does, uh, putting every single um, header information and content and uh, variation into a file. We don't do that. We use, just like Squid, a single file. But if you put that uh, on a file system and, uh, and access that instead of the raw disk, you already can see 10 to 15 percent performance impact, uh, even in traffic server. So I uh, imagine it will be pretty much the same in um, in, in Squid, Engine X, and um, Varnish too uses a backup uh, uh, on disk. Even though I mean, uh, the problem with Varnish, of course, is that it doesn't persist uh, the cache. So, so I, I can try to to answer your question a little bit. Uh, we have a lot of time, right? So I can take a few minutes? Yeah, of course. Right. We are here to... So, so, yes, you're right. So traffic server beer. is multi-threaded. It's actually pretty similar to how, how Nginx works. The, the main difference being that where Nginx uses a process, traffic uses a th server uses a thread, there will still be a small number of threads on your box, typically one or two per CPU. Um, one of the th actually two things we do to, to, to avoid the, what you worry about log contention, and, and one is we use a lot of log-free data structures. So they want they, they will use atomics. It still sort of has performance implications, but it's not nearly as bad as, as a, a, a locking uh, structure, right? The second thing is we try to do per thread uh, data and computation as much as possible, meaning you avoid the, the lock issue entirely. Certain pieces of data, certain pieces of computation happens on one single thread only. And when you do that, when you guarantee that, you, you don't have to worry about the, the, the thread uh, contention. For example, uh, all our stats and metrics gets calculated on each thread. Every five seconds, there's another thread that goes and collects the metrics from all the different threads up into the sort of central stats collector. Uh, and that way, we avoid all the locking, all the atomics, and all that stuff around those things. Uh, as far as performance concerned, it really depends on your hardware. It's reasonable to think that you almost always will be able to sustain uh, 
NIC bandwidth limitation, meaning if you have a gig Ethernet, you, you're going to sustain a gig Ethernet on modern hardware. And now if you're serving really, really, really small data, say a few hundred, meg a few hundred bytes per object, I think it's reasonable to think that you can do maybe in the order of hundreds of thousands of requests per second. Um, maybe another thing that would be uh, important in this case is that, of course, um, if, you're, uh, if you're extending traffic server uh, with your own plugins and uh, you put or you have to put uh, a giant lock somewhere in there uh, simply because of the nature of, uh, of how the processing has to happen in your particular case, then, of course, the, uh, the performance will be bound to that plugin. So there's nothing much that a uh, that the, uh, system underneath can do uh, to help you there. If, if your processing is that complex or needs that kind of locking, then, uh, then it has to happen. Okay, any more questions? Oh yes, thank you. That's that's actually a good <laughs> good thing. Um, we did a a recent release of 3.2.4, and every time we get together, we plan to do a uh, one month cycle of stable releases and and development releases, and maybe a six month uh, cycle of um, how do you call it? A, ver uh, major to, uh, a minor version upgrade, like 3.2, 3.4, and so on. We have semantic versioning, just like HCPD, to help you understand which, uh, which is the stable product and which is the development thing. But uh, this is really hard, because uh, we, we have so few people that are actually f paid full time to, to develop a uh, traffic server. Um, as opposed to many people who are involved in traffic server, like Jan is, pretty much full-time. Um, and yeah, so in this case, I, um, I cannot promise you a clear uh, road line, uh, roadmap. We want to get the Lua stuff in the next release, in the next uh, stable release in 3.4. Uh, that would, I think that would be a really big uh, bonus for um, admins and uh, is currently getting started. I missed some stuff, I suppose, in this war room when I attended a couple of talks here. So what um, <laughs> what Ellen said is partial object caching is is uh, currently being developed. That is, he and uh, Wei Jin are are doing that. Um, what else do we have on the list? I think we have uh, SSL and IPv6 we've uh, pretty much cleared in 3.3. So that's going to be in the next release. Uh, that yes, it is, but now it works both ways, properly. One of, the, one of the other big things that's going to come up that's in the 3.3 thing is accelerated range requests, where if you have a full object cache and the client requests a, just a range of that, it can go directly to that and uh, serve it without having to read the whole file. We've seen performance increases of up to 30 or factor of 30 or 40, seriously, uh, from this change. And another thing, and we're trying to extend that so we can actually cache, as, as we mentioned, partial ranges. So if you do a range request to the origin server, we can cast just that and serve it back later. So those are two of the big things that are coming up on the roadmap. And those are going to be in uh, 2.4, uh, 3.4. Uh, the range acceleration will be in 3.4 because that's already working on 3.3. Uh, we're not, we hope to get the partial object caching done for 3.4 as well, but mm -hmm. that's a little riskier. So one of the things that we are, um, uh, we're going to have those those stable releases 3.0 uh, we had uh, we had 3.2 we will have 3.4 uh, uh, 
we're going to, I mean, we're going to maintain those for a while, uh, probably as long as it's feasible, for uh, as long as we have volunteers, as long as we have, uh, as long as we have users of those. We will have to have a discussion about how many of those stable releases uh, we will uh, we will have out there. Um, we will, um, yeah. What what else is? I mean, there's not so much a roadmap as there is a to-do list uh, that needs to be uh, that needs to be clarified. Um, because I mean, the roadmap is uh, is pretty much dictated from what. Um, all those people want from traffic server and they then sit down and hack on it and contribute patches and uh, bug reports so that's uh, that's how the roadmap is dictated so if you want to get involved I suggest you just open a JIRA or uh, drop us a mail to the list and or I don't know maybe a documentation update I'd really love to see some of those um, yeah. Other questions or documentation patches? Leif, you're smiling. You, you have a big documentation update coming up. No? Uh, yeah. I had a, uh, this is just for closing. If, you're, if anyone is afraid of writing documentation, don't be. Uh, we, we had uh, documentation contributed to us back then from Zhao, who was very uncomfortable in his English, and it doesn't matter. The content was right, and we had somebody, I think it was me, uh, just get over it and, and, and fix the English so that an English, a native English speaker or somebody who knows English a little bit could parse it. But the content was right, and this is, uh, this is all that's needed for documentation. Just give, give us documentation, please. Okay, um, yes, that's uh, pretty much it. We'll be all week here. We'll have more talks. We'll have uh, more war rooms and hacking sessions. You're very much invited to just join us, ask us questions uh, with, with your particular strange use case. And uh, we're very happy to answer those. Okay, thank you very much.